and away we go. Hebrews, the fifth chapter. I mean, the sixth chapter. Actually, you got to start in the fifth chapter because it's, you know, remember it's a letter. And I always got to preface this every time because it's so easy to get into thinking it's to the Gentiles. This is a letter to the Jews because this chapter here, I'm telling you what, has been so misinterpreted. It's unbelievable. And it's going to be so much fun to get into it today. So anyway, to running into the scripture, into the chapter six, we're going to start off in like maybe say, uh, please mute. Don't shame. Anyway, getting into this, we start off in 12, 512 because, and run into it. But now you Jewish people should have been professors teaching college. Able to teach the rest of the world, but you are still struggling with ABCs or first grade of God's message in Christ. Please, everybody mute. 701-305-0068, please mute. The difference between the prophetic shadow and the real is, the, is that like milk and meat in your diet. You cannot live on baby food the rest of your life. Now think, you got milk and meat. We've heard about this the, all our Christian life, this is the meat. It's always something, some ridiculous thing. And it says what the meat is in the next verse. The revelation of righteousness is the meat of the word. Babes live on milk, the prophetic shadow. So does everyone who is not pierced to the heart of the revelation of Christ, the revealing of Christ. This is the nourishment of the mature. They are those who have their faculties, perceptions trained as by gymnastic precision to distinguish the relevant and the irrelevant. I'm not going to say what's relevant, irrelevant, because the next chapter he's going to say what's irrelevant. So we'll just leave that there. So anyway, I'm going to start off with a boom, okay? Galatians 2.21. Ready? This sums up the book a little bit. It is an insult to the grace of God to prefer Moses to Jesus. Whoa, it is an insult to the grace of God to prefer Moses to Jesus. If the law could justify you, then Jesus wasted his time dying your death. That would reduce salvation to a, a audacious contest between your obedience and the obedience of Christ. Wow. Wow. It is an insult to the grace of God to prefer Moses to Jesus. Think about that. The law came through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Think about it. Second Timothy is a 2.15. Timothy, show yourself approved. Accurately dividing the word of truth. Separate the old from the new. That's what this is all about, this book. Anyway, back on verse 1. Got a lot of scriptures for verse 1, but here we go. Consequently, as difficult as it may seem, you ought to divorce yourself from the sentimental attachment to the foreshadowing doctrine of Messiah. We got the marriage theme going, divorce yourself. I mean, come on. People have been divorced. Divorce is ugly. It's cutting away. It's making a new shift. It's leaving something behind. It's the marriage theme here. This is... Your sentimental attachment to the foreshadowing doctrine of Christ. The foreshadowing. Something coming. Which was destined to do what? What was the point of it? To carry us Jewish people like a vessel over the ocean of prophetic dispensation into what? The completeness of the fulfillment of the promise. And Christ is the promise. And he brought the inheritance. Now, since we got the marriage theme going on here, I just want to flip over to the seventh chapter of Romans. Actually, Pamela photocopy these things so I don't have to run all over the place but it says this look at 7 1 we got the marriage theme here and this can go for you know, of course it's talking about women you know committing adultery but it could be men it doesn't really matter he says I write to you in the context of your your acquaintance with the law so this is Paul talking in the seventh chapter of Romans he's saying for you who are acquainted to the law which would not be the Roman people other than the Jewish Roman people it wouldn't be the polytheist Romans he's directing this to the Jewish people you would agree with me that the laws are only relevant in this life. A wife is only bound by the law to her husband while he lives. Any further legal claim he has in her ends with, or ends with his death. This is a, just an analogy he's using here. He's not talking about, you know, the, the marriage. It's an analogy. The law would call her an adulteress 
should she give herself to another man while the first husband is also alive? Yet once he's dead, she is free to be another's wife. This is an analogy. We got the, we got the divorce theme going on here, marriage. You're married, married to the doctrine, the foreshadowing doctrine of Messiah. Divorce yourself from it. Here he says this. The very same principle, finality and principle, is applicable to you, my brothers and sisters. In the incarnate Christ, you died to the system of the law. He's talking to the Jewish people, Jewish Romans. To, in the incarnate Christ, incarnation, God present in a man, Jesus Christ, you died to the system of the law. Your inclusion in his resurrection brought a new union, a new marriage. Out of this marriage, faith now bears children unto God. Wow. You died to the law and you now are married to Christ. And now you can bear fruit for, uh, fruit for God. Anyway, so let's keep going on here. So other scriptures here. Let's keep going on. God, now listen to this. You ready? A mind shift from attempts. Listen to this closely. A mind shift from attempts to impress God. And I mean, all the stuff we were impressing God. I love in Romans 8 chapter when he says, the, you know, the, the old system is like the spirit of slavery leading us by fear. The old one responds to Abba, Father. Like, wow, fondly to Abba. I said that last week. Responding fondly to our Father because of a love relationship. He says here, a mind shift from attempts to impress God by your behavior to what? Realizing the faithfulness of God and what God did for you and on your behalf. Now, are we going to do things that, I mean, everybody, when they see this, that doesn't know anything, always thinks, well, that means you can just do whatever you want. Well, I, God changes your desires. If my desires aren't to do stupid things, I'm not going to do them. There was a day when I desired to do dumb things. I did them. My desires change. I've had a metanoia in my mind, a change, shift. Things that give me des desires that give me life and goodness. Realizing the faithfulness of God is fundamental. Again, if this is fundamental, we should read it again. A mind shift from attempts to oppress God by your behavior to realizing the faithfulness of God is fundamental. There is no life left in the old system. There is no life left in the old system. Now, remember, talking to the Jewish people, when we bring it to the Gentiles in Galatians, what did they, what did they want to do? They wanted to bring back the old system. And the letter, 2 Corinthians 3, 6, says the letter does what? It kills. The spirit brings life. The letter kills. That's all it can do. There's no life left in the old system. It is dead and gone. You have to move on. That's pretty like, woo! So, so add a couple scriptures to that. Let's see here. Romans 3.27, he puts that in the, the bottom. It says, the law of faith cancels the law of works. The law of faith cancels the law of works, which means there's suddenly nothing left for anyone to boast in. Because God did it all. No one is superior to another. We are not superior to one another. We are equal to one another. Four, what do they got? Hebrews 8.13, I love this scripture. When God speaks of a new covenant, we're going to get to that in a couple of weeks. A new covenant. We're under a new agreement. The Jews are under a new agreement. He makes the first one obsolete. The law system is obsolete. And whatever is becoming obsolete, out of use, annulled, and growing old is ready to disappear. But just remember, that's what hap has happened in Christendom. We've resurrected the old system and tried to amalgamate them together. Grace and works. And you've heard other people say this. I'll say it again. Grace plus grace equals grace. Law plus law equals law. Grace plus law equals law. A little leaven leavens a whole lump of dough. If you put a little yeast and you're making a cracker, you, you no longer have a cracker. A little law kills. Second Corinthians 3.14. Since the time of Moses until this very day, their minds remain callous and veiled. They are kept in suspension without realizing there is no glory left in the law. Whatever glory there was carried merely a fading, fading, you know, the lights going out, prophetic glimmering. Reading the Old Testament without understanding that Christ is the fulfillment of the scriptures is a complete waste of time. Wow. 
Only in discovering our union with Christ is the veil removed, and do we realize that the old system is rendered entirely useless. I have another scripture, but I think that's enough. I think I made my point. <laughs> On to verse two. This is great. I love this stuff, by the way. You can tell. All the Jewish teachings. Now, this is where we go off the rails in Christendom because we think this applies to us. He's, the, these are the milk that he's talking about in the previous chapter. This is the milk. The revelation of righteousness would be like Hebrews 11th chapter, which is 11.1, which is the pinnacle, in my opinion, of the whole book. Now faith is. This is the milk. All the Jewish teachings about ceremonial washes or baptisms, and they have lots of them, the laying on of hands. Now, I'm glad he clarified this because for years I thought he meant actually praying for people, but he doesn't. In order to identify with the slain animal as a sacrifice, the high priest would grab the horns or the head of the of the bull and pass the sins on. So he's talking about. And all the teachings pertaining to sin consciousness, including the final resurrection of the dead, in order to face judgment, are no longer relevant. Woo! Shocking. Let's read that again. All the Jewish teachings about ceremonial washings and baptisms, the laying on hands in order to identify with a slain animal as a sacrifice, and all the teachings pertaining to sin consciousness, you're a sinner, you're a sinner, you're no good, you're a sinner including the final resurrection of the dead in order to face judgment. How many times have we been taught that are no longer relevant? Selah. Pause and calmly think of that. Shocking. Milk. This is awesome, isn't it? A little bit of the commentary here. His resurrection bears testimony to the judgment that he faced on mankind's behalf. Can I find the Bible, please? And he faced on mankind's behalf and the freedom from the obstructive consciousness of sin that he now proclaims. Let me see here. I, I, I don't need, I can just. In uh, Hebrews, the 10th chapter, I'm just going to do this really quickly. In the first verse, it says, if the, if the blood of bulls and goats was able to, not to forget, perfect the believer. Next verse says, the believer would once all be perfected from sin, and sin would be taken care of, and he'd no longer be conscious of sin and guilt. Then you go over, I think it's verse 10, it says, we have been made holy, how? By the body of Jesus Christ. You're holy. Why? Somebody says, Yo, you need holiness. I am holy because of the body of Jesus Christ. And verse 14 says, we are forever completely perfected and forgiven, past, present, and future. So now, if you go over to that, insert Christ in that first verse, if Christ perfected us, us, the worshipers, will no longer be conscious of what? Sin and guilt. Whoa. So it is with God's prompting that we what? Advance. Advance from the ABCs back to being professors again to teach the whole world. For the prophetic types and shadows of Scripture into the substance of what God has now spoken to us in what sonship? That's the first verse. In the old days, he's spoken to our forefathers in ancient days in little glimpses of revelations, pieces of puzzle. In these last days, he's spoken in sonship, in incarnation, redeemed, image and likeness. Now, it may be that someone may clearly see. This is what, this is, just so you, just to set you up here. This is always taught if somebody like went backslid and it was always, there's never, you know, they went out and become a, they went back to drugs or whatever else. You can't turn them back because that's what's taught. Just complete nonsense because he's talking to the Jewish people. He's saying here, now it may be that someone may clearly see the prophetic word. The prophetic word is something before Christ came. Christ isn't the prophetic word. He, he isn't, excuse me, he is the prophetic word before he came, but now he's not. He's the incarnation. This is before Christ came. He's talking about. Someone may clearly see the light of the prophetic word and participate in the Holy Spirit by already 
having assembled the heavenly gift. That's before Christ came, because why? Christ was crucified when? From the foundations of the earth. You could tap into it already. People were tapping into it. The prophets who prophesied of the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired about the salvation they inquired what a person or time was indicated by the spirit of Christ within them when they predicted the sufferings of Christ and subsequent glory. Could you go to Hebrews, the fifth chapter over there? Or sixth chapter. Anyway, I'll say it again. Now it may be that someone may clearly see the light of the prophetic word and participate in the Holy Spirit by already sampling the heavenly gift. Verse six, five. <clears throat> And they might even begin to what? Feast on the beauty of the word, the logic of God, God's ways, faith. Even, and we know that because we got chapter 11, the, the heroes and heroines of faith. Already having experienced the power of the age and the promise that we're already waiting for. Okay, so I'm going to read it and amplify just because it's there too. It's amazing to me how many times I've read the mirror and I go back to the regular version and go, wow, it was there. I just didn't see it correctly. Because all of a sudden I had a little mind shift because of the mirror. Sixth chapter, fourth and fifth verse. For it is impossible to restore and bring to repentance again those who have been once for all enlightened, who have consciously tasted the heavenly gift and have become shares in the Holy Spirit. And have felt how good the word of God is and the mighty of the powers of the age and the world to come. Because why? In our thinking in evangelical Christianity and probably even sacramental Christianity, the ages to come is when I die. And, or when he comes back and kills, like most of the population on earth because they don't believe in him. And vindicate us people who do believe so then we can look so good. Don't think so. Christ is the same today, yesterday, forever. He didn't do that when he was here. He's not doing it later. But my point is, the power and the age to come has come. We are in the last days. Christ is the eschatos. He is the end. One John, it says, we know we're in the last days because many antichrists have went out from our midst. That's how we know. If such a person were to insist on relapsing into what the old mindset of legalism the mindset of legalism. In other words, they come to faith, but no, now I'm going to go back to the temple. I'm going to start doing the sacrifices over and over. I'm going to do all the traditions and you know, all the stuff. It's all pointing to Jesus, to the Christ. All their festivals, all their traditions, everything pointed to him. And later it says, hey, they're cultivated soil. That's how God cultivated the soil, through the prophetic, waiting for the seed to come. Who is Christ? Remember, if one seed doesn't die, then there's only remains alone. John 12. It becomes impossible for him to be restored again, again to metanoia, to change his mind. Repentance. The principle of repeat repentance as practiced under the law does not make sense in the context of the new dispensation because it would be absurdly implying that Christ was being crucified and subject to public shame over and over and over. When we continue to repent, we're subjecting Christ to shame like you know think about that we have to confess our sins and get right with god really behold the lamb of god who takes away the sin of the world when he had removed or how does it say accomplished the ridden of sin and guilt he sat down he has done it it's over and he's done that for every human being so what kind of judgment are we going to face at the end when he doesn't, Romans 8 says he doesn't even, or Hebrews 8 doesn't even remember our sins. Kind of like that judgment. I mean, come on. Which I don't believe there is, by the way. Jesus took the judgment, John 12. He says, today is the judgment of the world. He took it on himself. He took our punishment. That's the point. You know, when we do all this stuff, we... We try to participate in our salvation. No, no. He saved you completely. You don't save yourself by your confession. He saved you. Your confession is just lining up a metanoia, getting your mind straight with what God already did. The new order is not to be confused with the old. Not to be confused. Because it's different. Grace is not a cheap excuse for sin. Sin is, remember, hamatia, not knowing your form and lot of portion. You got to go back to Adam. He ate of the tree of the knowledge and proneros, evil. And he changed his opinion of himself. He was no longer made God's image and likeness, but God still thought he was. 
and they turn and make God in his image and likeness judgmental and he run and hid in shame. We do the same thing in Christian, by the way. We make a mistake and, you know, we eat of that tree because we're so dumb. I was dumb for many years, by the way. I included myself in there. And then we run around and hide. And then we have a, you know, I like, I like this word, you know, because we use it at work a lot, a workaround. We have something to do, but we can get a workaround. The workaround is our confessing our sins on God's happy because he doesn't, he doesn't remember. I mean, he, he needs to know that, you know, I, I confess and agree that, no, no, homologio is to confess what he believes about my sin. He believes he's forgiven it. He believes that Christ took it all. You are free from the old rules and bondage of the duty-driven law of willpower. How is your willpower working? Not very good. But God changes our desires. Ooh, Philippians 2.13, for it is God all the while in you to will and to do his good pleasure, satisfaction, delight. He's given you his very desires. It is impossible for the old system to match the new one. That would be 2 Corinthians 3. The old kills. The old condemns. The new gives life. The new gives righteousness. And they're opposites. The new doesn't, can't kill, can't give condemnation. The old one can't give life, can't give righteousness. Under the shadow system, we've already read this, but I'll say it again. This is, the, this is the commentary. Under the shadow system of the law, sacrifices were repeatedly slain because no permanent cleansing was possible. I just read, I just talked about that in Hebrews uh, 10.1. That's repentance, metanoia, meta, together, to perceive with the mind. That's what the word and most of you know this, but the word repentance is a word slapped on the word metanoia. And the word repentance does not belong in there. Everywhere it's put, this word is in there. And it means awakening of the mind to that which is true and realigning of my reasoning to gather my thoughts to co-know with what God knows. It says faith is not a decision. And of course, the Latin word is, I'm going to take a whack at it. I don't, I don't think, I know I'm not striking out, but I'm not hitting a home run here, but Pain and tintentia, probably a foul ball. Indeed, the penance, or the, it's penance. It's, you know, you, penance, you pay for your sin. I mean, you confess it, then you do something to forget. That's nonsense. Jesus paid for your sins even before you were born. Now listen, it's the cultivated soil. Listen to what he says. How did the God cultivate it? He cultivated it through the traditions. He cultivated it through their festivals. The Passover, the tent of meeting, all this stuff. He, he All the... the high priest, it all pointed to Jesus. But when the cultivated soil, he's talking about the Jewish people, is soaked by frequent showers and produces the useful life-giving crop expected by the farmer, the harvest brings much celebration. Now, interesting over in the Hebrews or Romans 11 chapter, he talks about the olive tree. He talks about the, the original or the cultivated olive tree, which is the Jewish people. And like me, a wild olive tree that's been grafted in. They were cultivated by their culture. God was setting up to bring Yeshua right in the middle of it, Christ. And all these things pointed to him. That's why Jesus said, you search the scriptures diligently because you think in them you have eternal life, but you failed to come to me. Those scriptures speak of me. They cultivated. Think about that. Preparing the soil of their heart. And he, having said all this, my dear, okay. What a complete disappointment though. Now think about this. It's still cultivated soil. You know, we think maybe, oh, the cultivated soil is the first. No, they're both cultivated soil. But what a complete disappointment, though. If the same soil, the cultivated soil, produces nothing but thorns and thistles, it is worthless, yield, and fit for burning like a dream that has gone up in smoke. Now, think about it. If you eat of the tree of life, that's the faith tree, you produce fruit. If you eat of the law tree, which is the, the law tree is, the law of Moses is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's what it is. And it produces Thorns and thistles, just like it did for Adam. Why would you think, if it did that for the Jews, did that for Adam, that it's going to do anything different for you and me? Abandon it. Divorce yourself. This is huge. You want to be blessed? Divorce yourself. Eat of the faith tree, the same tree Abraham ate of, and was blessed, blessed, blessed. Right. Just a scripture just came to me. Galatians 3 again. Love Galatians. Hope you're having fun with my little subtle talk. Here we are again. Well, verse 9. I like it in the Amplified. I got to say it here. 
So then, those who are people of faith, which is we are, are blessed. Blessed, made happy and favored by God. How? With the believing and trusting Abraham. Remember, when Abraham walked the earth, there was no law. It came with Moses, 400 and some years later. But, he, but the law was conscious in their minds. That's why God brought it on the earth so they could see it, experience it. But Abraham was a faith guy. God spoke to him. He just believed and it was reckoned to his account as righteousness. All right. Having said all this, my dear friends, and he's talking to his Jewish brothers and sisters, and I say he generically. I don't know. It's like when the waitress always come and call me God, all of us guys. I am fully convinced of God's love for you. What God accomplished in the salvation on your behalf is beyond what comparison to anything you were familiar with before. It's, you can't even compare this with the old system. Salvation realities echo what the law could only what foreshadow, foreshadow. They're only foreshadow. This is what's coming. And they were all excited about it. But then he shows up and they reject it. Interesting, isn't it? John 1, he came to his own and his own didn't what? Recognize him. Then they were cultivated soil. And the people that studied the hardest became the most legalistic, rejected him the most. Interesting. God is not unfair. Neither is he. I love this. A little bit of exhortation for them. God is not unfair, neither is he unaware of the affectionate way in which you have honored his name and, dilig and the diligence you have shown in your unrelenting religious service in keeping all the sacred rituals and ceremonies even to this present day. And those were important because those were the ones that would kind of give you the symbolism of Christ and to recognize him when he showed up. So it was important that they did that. I urge you to employ the same sincere devotion to now realize the fulfillment of everything that the old system anticipated. Wow. A fulfillment of everything the old system anticipated. They were anticipating Messiah. Many of them still are. Now, it goes back. It says, divorce yourself from the old system. Now, think about it. This is a, maybe a horrible analogy. But if someone prophesied, you don't, you don't have any money. And someone says, God is going to give you a house. And, you know, two years later, you say, okay, you believe. Two years later, you get this beautiful house. You, someone gives it to you. Some crazy thing happens. And then going back to you, say, oh, yeah, Lord, you're going to give me a house someday. You're going to give me a house. No, you got the house. Move on from the prophecy. We do not want you to behave like what illegitimate, illegitimate children. They're not illegitimate children, by the way, but behave like them. Unsure of the share of your inheritance because you're, this is, belongs to you. You're the chosen people. Mimic the faith of those who, what, through their patience, came to possess the promise of their allotted portion. It took them a while. They had to be patient. The testing of your faith produces what? Endurance. It's not a sprint. It's a marathon. you got to wait sometimes. you just got to keep believing. Since God had no one greater, I love this, by whom to swear, he swore by himself. Hmm. Who can, uh, what's higher order than me that you know, give it to, as surely to people that they would know that I'm really serious? Hmm, no one greater to swear by, I swear by myself. I'll give it as an oath by myself. He could give Abraham no greater guarantee, but what? The integrity, his integrity of his own being, who God is. This makes the promise as sure as God is. And we are grafted, us Gentiles, or maybe there's some Jewish people on here, us Gentiles are grafted in to this promise, saying, I will continue to speak well of you. I will confirm my intentions always and only to bless you and to multiply you beyond measure. Now, since we have the faith of Abraham and we are children of Abraham by faith, say this. This applies to us. It says, God says, I will continue to speak well of me. He will speak well of me. He will confirm his intentions only to bless me and to multiply me beyond measure. And as a quick rabbit trail, Romans 8.28 says, God turns all things to good for those who love God and are called to according to his purpose. Abraham is the perfect example of that because twice he told a Pharaoh and then King Amalek that his wife was a sister. They got taken into the, their harem and then God scolded them and he gave them back and God made them rich and made Abraham rich at the same time. It doesn't seem fair, but that's what happened. You have the same kind of blessing. I mean, I, I, one of my confessions when I do it is, Lord, when I do good stuff and when I do dumb stuff, you turn it all for good. I mean, think about it. He chews out the Pharaoh. He chews out Amalek, the king. Dries up all the wombs because of Sarah, because it's his wife. 
I mean, he's a chicken. He could have said, I'm a mighty warrior. That's my wife. Oh, hey, you're beautiful, and they're probably going to kill you because of me. So just say you're my sister, which is a half truth. Right? And he gets blasted, and the other guy gets chewed out. Doesn't seem fair, does it? You're the same kind of people. And so, and so Abraham continued in patience and secured the promise. It is common practice in human affairs to evoke a, what, a higher authority under oath in order to what add weight to any agreement between parties, to add weight to it. I, God could have said, I, just, I agree to do it, but then he says, oh, I'm going to add some weight to it. I'm going to make an oath by something. No, there's nothing higher than myself, but I'll swear by myself. All of this, therefore, adding weight to agreement between parties, therefore silencing any possible quibblings. I love the word quibblings, which means arguments, disagreements. In other words, we settle it. You don't have to argue about it. It's settled. In the same context, we are confronted with God's eagerness to go to the last extreme. I love that. God's eagerness. You ever think God be eager? And what is he eager to do? To go to the last extreme in dealing with us as what heirs of promise, convincing you. And to cancel out all possible grounds for doubt and dispute. Why? In order to persuade us of the unalterable character and finality of his resolve. Final resolve. Finality of resolve is resolved. is done. He confined himself to an oath. He confined himself to an oath. The promise which already belongs to us by heritage, it already belonged to the Jewish people by heritage, is now also confirmed by an oath. And then it, in the commentary there, it talks about Galatians 3.20. I'm just going to say it because I love it. So the old covenant had two, uh, had agreement between God and man. And if man was good and did what God said, God blessed. And if he did what he wasn't supposed to do, God cursed. But the new covenant has no mediator. Abraham is only God who promised. And that's the promise. God promises he's not counting on your behavior and your goodness or badness to complete it. He's given as virtue a promise and he's made an oath to make sure that you understand that he's, how can you say, or should I say it? He's going to do it. It doesn't count on us. It counts on God who makes the promise. And I, that to me is good news. If it counted on me, it wouldn't be good news. I'll say my old saying. The gospel means good news. If it doesn't sound like good news, it's not the gospel. It depends on me. It's not good news. Because God doesn't, de- God's not stupid and he does, I'm not dependable. So he doesn't depend on me. I am not dependable, but God is dependable. I used to go to promise breakers or, or promise keepers and be like, figured out later it's called promise breakers. There's only one promise keeper. His name is Jesus, the Father, the Son, the Spirit. They're the only promise keepers. 18. So that we are now dealing with two irre- irreversible facts which make it impossible for anyone, anyone to prove God wrong. What are they? His oath and his promise. Thus our persuasion, our faith, as to to our redeemed identity. We had it, and now it's redeemed. We are God's image and likeness. Now we know again that we're in God's image and likeness. Is is powerfully what reinforced. This is all all to us too. We have already escaped into what? Already escaped, past tense, into the destiny, into that destiny of what? Our redeemed innocence, that we are, Father sees us as he sees his son, Jesus. As we behold as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, which is us, or transfigured into his very own image. He's the very image of the Father, of God. If you see me, you've seen the Father. Our expectation has come within our immediate grasp. But got it. Verse 19, our hearts and minds are certain anchored securely gotta say that anchored securely our hearts and minds are certain where what are they They're, our hearts and minds are anchored securely within what the innermost courts of god the immediate presence beyond remember the prophetic veil because the veil has been torn it's done this is all invisible but symbolism john 1420, in that day, Jesus says to the Jewish people, you will know in that day, coming in the future, that I am currently in the Father, and the Father's in me, and that I am currently in you. I mean you now. By going there on our behalf, Jesus pioneered a place for us, a place for me and a place for you. 
and removed every type of obstacle that could possibly distance itself us uh, from the promise. There's no separation from the God, Father, Son, and Spirit. And there's no separation from our inherit inheritance. And there's no separation from the promise. In him, we are represented for all time. For how long are we represented? All time. He became our high priest after the order of Melchizedek, which is the next chapter. We now, right now, currently enjoy the same privilege, access, as Jesus does. Say, I currently enjoy the same privilege access to face to face with Papa as Jesus does, because I'm in union with him. He paved the way by his death, resurrection, and ascension, the finished work of the cross. Okay. 